I'm Thomas Time, I'm the President and CEO of Direct Relief, but I'm going to introduce to you uh, the Miller McCune Executive, Executive Director of the Miller McCune UCSB Arts and Lecture Series, and that would be Celesta Lecce. Christoph and Sarah Miller McCune. Now, thank you so much for uh, for coming tonight. I love the partnership. My name is Celesta. I am. I love the partnership with Direct Relief. Um, I love Thomas. Uh, I love, I love many. I love you too. <laughs> it's very special. Um, but we just talk about that later. Um, but uh, but really, um, I look out there and I see so many people who are involved with Direct Relief. Inter no international, I know. Direct Relief, but also arts and lectures. It's a very wonderful, wonderful collaboration and partnership we have between these two organizations. I want to acknowledge and thank Dorothy Largue in the second row, quiet, quiet small woman over there, but she's fantastic because she helped get this going. <laughs> very special friend to both of our organizations, and so I thank her for that. I'm very proud that Nick Kristoff is back in our community. He'll tell you all the amazing things that he has done today already. He must be exhausted. Um, but I'm just here to say thank you to, to DRI, DR, sorry, but also to, um, to thank a very special person who, um, two things, to thank the Orfala Foundation. Natalie, where are you? Back there. Natalie's back there. Um, for arts and lectures, the Orfala Foundation is our first ever community partner. They're very important and they're a sponsor of tonight's event and all the activities in our community. So please go up and give a hug and a high five to Natalie to thank her for that because the impact when Nick is here and does things in the community, that's because of the Orfala Foundation. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you. And then tonight's presentation. Tonight's wonderful presentation um, is sponsored by the one and only, my namesake, Sarah Miller McCune. So please join me in thanking Ms. Sarah Miller McCune. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the microphone to the one and only, Nick Kristoff. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah, um, and Dorothy and Natalie and all John Roman, all the direct relief directors and everyone for just making the time tonight. Um, I, it was my job to introduce uh, Nick Kristoff and true story, uh, his Wikipedia page is uh, nine pages and um, I'm not kidding and I'm very, very sensitive to that because our Wikipedia page was deleted in its entirety, entirety by someone named Blue Raspberry uh, this week because Apparently there was an unsighted reference that had been up for two years, so... Um, do you go by Blue Raspberry at all? Because I was a little <laughs> peeved. His Wikipedia page is very well cited, and it, I will just mention a few things. So, uh, just another reason to lean in and listen to what he has to say. Um, born on a sheep and cherry farm in Yamhill, Oregon, which I checked today had a population of 794 in the last census. Um, true story. Grown hugely from uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, grad, uh, he, Nick graduated from Yamhill Carlton High School where he was student body president, school newspaper editor, and later going on to uh, Harvard College where he was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate. He then uh, went on to uh, obtain a Rhodes Scholar, uh, earning his law degree with first class honors and it's a little much, really, but uh, it goes on. And this is just like when he's 20, okay? Um, in 1990, he won his first Pulitzer Prize uh, with his wife, Cheryl Wudun, for the, the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting for their reporting on, among other things, Tiananmen Square. He, uh, among the other awards I can't mention for time, he won his second Pulitzer Prize uh, the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary in 2006 for his graphic, deeply reported columns that, at personal risk, focused attention on genocide in Darfur and gave voice to the voiceless in other parts of the world. It, this goes on and on, but I'm telling you, it's, um, he will, it someday will be Saint Nick and we'll have to figure out what to do with Santa Claus because he can't really win many more awards. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome back to uh, Direct Relief, Nicholas Kristoff. Welcome. Thank you. So, 
after reading your Wikipedia page and your book, I mean, um, the, there's so many questions, but I really thought a couple of things that might be interesting is, um, really you talked about the role of the individual and how important that is, kind of the spark that you seem to find where others don't, kind of this dynamism, energetic positivity that is inspiring, um, it must be inspiring to you because your words convey that to your readers. And you've also touched on these roles about this evolving role of philanthropy versus governments, and as well as businesses' involvement in some of these issues of the day. So let's start with the first one. How is it that you find these gems amongst our species and, um, and go find them and are able to connect with them where no one else seems to either look or find it worth writing about? What made that happen? Um, well, part of it, I think, addresses what I believe is one of the problems in both journalism and uh, philanthropy, that we tend to focus on the problem so much that we leave people, we leave the public with the impression that everything is failing, that uh, the war on global poverty has collapsed, and it makes it unpalatable for people to be involved in it. And I, um, uh, you know, I, I actually got interested in this when I was covering Dark War because uh, this is back, you know, beginning of 2004, and I was off there I was seeing these horrific sights, writing these columns, and it felt like they were disappearing without a ripple. And then I'd go back to New York, and all of New York was then up in arms. You may remember this about these two uh, red-tailed hawks. Do you remember this? Uh, pale male and... I can't remember what Pale Mill's wife's name was, <laughs> but these two hawks that had lived in a nest in a building on, on um, right next to Central Park, and they're, because of the bird droppings, their building had uh, taken down their nest, and all New York was so upset about this, and I couldn't generate the same amount of outrage about hundreds of thousands of people being slaughtered in Darfur, and I thought, what is wrong with my columns? And so that led me to look at the work about what makes us care. And it turns out essentially to be about two things. One, about individual stories, and it's an emotional pathway, not a rational one. So in fact, if you, one uh, set of researchers asked people to do some math problems, and then they asked people to donate, and people donated less. That when the more rational parts of the brain were in the foreground, then people were less compassionate, less empathetic. And so one lesson is it's about individual uh, stories and an emotional pathway, and then you can throw in the information. And the other thing is that it can't be all negative, because that's a turnoff. And you can't guilt trip people into trying to make a difference. It has to be something that is inspiring and hopeful. So that led me to you know, look for uh, individual stories that may plumb the depths of despair for a while, but also have some kind of arc that show that if people get engaged, they can make a difference. And um, I think that I think That's we the Amtrak train folks are out the back wall. Sorry about that. <laughs> Down home here, Nick. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, this question of how we how we convey to the public that yes, there are real problems out there but there also has been tremendous progress and that if people will chip in more that you know, we can make more progress. This is the generation that is gonna wipe, wipe out extreme poverty and that is not depressing but exciting. I think one of the things that kind of comes up is we were talking to, um, actually we're at the Human Rights Watch annual dinners, similar thing, I think these are people who are motivated not by commercial um, they're not economically motivated people entirely, um, but they sacrifice themselves to really look out for people for whom there's not a strong business case. They don't have a lot of money, um, therefore they don't necessarily engage the business. It's hard to make a business case to do some of the things. Uh, there's actually no business case in many cases, or businesses would have engaged. Um, but the paradox is you actually can't be able to help them without engaging, as you said, some of the tools that have been developed in business, the tools of scale, which Direct Relief has been doing. And one of the things that, in marrying the positivity the individual story, you also talked about the importance of not divorcing and thinking it's well, businesses are those things that should um, pay more taxes or give more money to charities, which is what Direct Relief has been doing for its essence, just invite their participation. There's a lot of talent, in fact, more, 
probably locked up in corporate um, activities. So it, to us, it makes no sense to not include them. You can't solve these problems without their participation, but Absolutely. you talked about that. Uh, What's your sense of how that's evolving? You know, I, I think that there really is a change coming along here. That there has been this kind of crazy binary thinking, this bifurcation that we've had, that we've seen, that, or the public has often seen uh, for-profit corporations as evil, greedy, nonprofits as noble, uh, worthy, and obviously it's, you know, it's much more complicated than that. It's basically about impact. And there are some nonprofits that have no impact, and there are some for-profits that have a real social impact. And what matters at the end of the day is impact. And likewise, in our um, investments or donations, if you will, we have the same sort of crazy bifurcation that, you know, a family will take a portion of their extra money that they will uh, designate as their you know, their philanthropic contribution or their charity donation, and they will give that away 100%. They want zero return on that, and they want 100% social impact. Meanwhile, there is another pool of money that they want to invest in the market, and for that, they want no social impact and the highest possible return possible. And, you know, there should be something in between. There should be ways that we maybe will want to invest some money uh, in a for-profit company that also has social impact and maybe accept a, a somewhat reduced return as a result. Uh, and we're seeing that, we're beginning to see that with double bottom line companies, with triple bottom line companies, with impact investing, all of which has the benefit that it's more sustainable than a traditional nonprofit. And likewise, as you say, I mean, the skill set in the for-profit sector is so huge and traditionally, for-profits have engaged in, um, in, in CSR and corporate social responsibility that has basically been, hasn't accomplished much. It's been, not a failure is a little strong, but it's been largely window dressing. I think that that may change. I mean, I think that companies are realizing that if they want to compete for millennials, if they want to recruit and retain the best people, they have to do a better job of projecting values of CSR. And one thing they can do is lend people with great skill sets to the nonprofit sector. They take, um, you know, a marketing specialist or a, um, you know, an accounting specialist or an IT specialist and lend that person, the f that can be incredibly powerful to, to a nonprofit. Yeah, it turns out, uh, Peter, are you here? Um, Peter? Yeah. Peter, okay, Peter is, a, is exactly the, the company GSK, um, formerly known as GlaxoSmithKline, a big global, has over the past four years sent us 60 high-performing professionals, including chief scientists, uh, optimization planner for, right? And um, Kate, a marketing expert who's here. Uh, Kate, Sean, we had 60 people uh, that are at that, exactly what you've said. And I think part of what we think is like, having money is great, but Money is only, you actually take money and you convert it into something else. You buy goods and services with money. So the, the secret from our board of directors, many deeply accomplished business folks, is like, what is it that you would do if you had money? And maybe someone, you can invite their participation directly, which is why, you know, in our case, we're running SAP, which is this huge, massive powerhouse. But you need it if you're running a global distribution uh, company that handles prescription medications that could kill you if taken wrong. So, but that notion, exactly what you talked about, the disconnect has been something that uh, we're trying to bridge in our own little way, but I think you have a much bigger megaphone, well, and thank you for sure. actually doing it far better than I could um, with all your Harvard, Oxford, <laughs> New York Times degrees. Well, you know, I think one of the problems is that we've inadvertently trained the public to think that overhead is this evil thing in the nonprofit sector. and. We sort of train people to be a little bit careful about, you know, how they donate to charities, and so they go to, to Charity Navigator and they look at the overhead ratios. And, you know, look at the end of the day, we don't want to donate to an NGO so that it builds a marble lobby for itself. But overhead is not is not evil. Overhead is how you get efficient. Overhead is how you uh, actually do have an impact. And so, uh, but the NGO sector tends to be so fearful of spending, of investing in overhead for fear of screwing up its, uh, its charity navigator uh, uh, financial ratios 
that they tend to underinvest, and so that's another reason why precisely companies that lend people with great skill sets and toolboxes uh, can have such a powerful effect on the company they're supporting, and also internally on morale of, of employees, of staff. When you mentioned that, I think the other example, I just had about five minutes to show uh, Nick some of the things that DirectLeaf has been doing. You were one of the first to really shine the light on the kind of this awful problem of obstetric fistula. It's not easy to write about, and you made it interesting, and it's inherently compelling, and really only affects people who are, uh, they're poor to begin with and they're destitute after. And so we've been at it trying to think, just being against it doesn't do anything, so how do you take the Edna Adans, the people who are working on it, find them, and then stitch them together and tackle it? So I was kind of proud. We now have uh, worked with the UN, uh, FPA, and the Fischer Foundation. So if you look at the global fistula map.org, you will see every documented place where obstetric fistula is being done. And we run that. And so people who are interested can see where the problem is, how it can be done. And a lot of that is really thanks to what you started by shining a light on this, that there's no reason to shine a light for any business uh, on people who are destitute in rural Africa. But the only way to solve the, uh, the problem is to bring in the technology, to bring in the mapping, to bring in the scale and the efficiencies uh, and get it done. So among other things, thank you very much for helping raise that issue. And I hope that you well, see some of your you know, legacy yeah. reflected in that I as mean, well. Thanks to all of you for, for doing that, because I mean, you may think of uh, direct relief as you know, this location or as this entity. I tend to think of it as this network of tiny little hospitals and clinics that I visited all over the world. I don't associate direct relief with this place. I associate it with Edna Adan's clinic in Somaliland or uh, Ponzi, yeah. and, uh, Ponzi Hospital in Congo, uh, a hospital in Sierra Leone. Um, and you know, in these in these places that are just desperately needy, and I mean the the way they, uh, you know, the, I, I remember one hospital that they took uh, old gloves and they were using them to, to 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 hold blood that was seeping through. I mean, they were just reusing everything in every possible way. Um, uh, you know that everything goes so far. And so that's, so my vision of a direct relief is not this building, it's not, uh, or ne it's this incredible network of uh, amazing outposts around the world from Somaliland to South America. It was very flattering when, you know, before Nick's trip he said, so I'm going to Burma, do you know anyone good? Dr. Cynthia is here, right? Um, Dr. Cynthia, um, who said, we said, she's very good. I think the Myanmar Medical Association were uh, a from so it's great we we're like the same kind of talent scout that you are but what we can provide is often material support and you can provide them visibility and a narrative that is deeply compelling so um anytime we can help kind of help you plan your trip i was just showing him some of the other maps about uh just today we released the state of the safety net for all of the u.s community health workers that direct relief is now supporting in all states um, but there's a million good stories, and uh, we'd love to plan your next itinerary and look to her. So. Well, I'm, I'm glad also you're doing the U.S. too, because I think that one of the problems for, I mean, I don't know how you made the decision to, to, to do the U.S. too in a, in a big way, but I do think that, that organizations that only engage abroad, that there becomes this, they then get asked this question all the time, well, what about the U.S.? And it's kind of this awkward question, and I, I don't, to me, there shouldn't be a trade-off there, and you know we should be able to worry about the U.S. and Sierra Leone at the same time. We don't. We shouldn't have to pick between them. But um, I, I. And your book does the same thing. I mean, I think you know, for us, it's like it's the same issue. Community health workers are now kind of the thing internationally. Jeffrey Sachs is involved. Directly, actually helped map the one million community health worker campaign launch at the United Nations. The funny thing is that in the United States we have. 8,000 clinics that are called community health centers that serve one in 13 people in this country, and they don't have any profile at all, but that is the front door to the health system here. They're deeply dedicated folks, and they get very good quality care. That's provable. They have demonstrable evidence of that. Um, so I think part of it is the attention span, the, um, and you know, you, again, we don't have that uh, power to influence, and we're trying to stay out of the political debate, 
but we certainly appreciate what you've done, kind of the transcendent issues of altruism, um, of both efficiency and, uh, you know, engagement. And, um, but really, I, I, to shift gears a little bit, one of the questions that ar arose for me in reading your book is what, kind of this nature of NGOs being kind of, when I was about your age, there was still the aroma of the Kennedy administration. Public service meant government service, often military service, but public service was kind of perceived as um, government. And now, if you ask our young staff, we have far more people applying, they read your stories, they want to be in an NGO. I think, well, public service is kind of being done privately, but how, if we're expecting governments to solve the big problems, are they going to have the talent pool inside? I mean, the dilemma of like making the NGOs cool, is it hollowing out the government that we kind of expect to do that? You're writing a lot about that. What's your sense of this evolving role of governments versus nonprofits and, and the talent necessary in both? You know, I think that among young people, and I'm, I don't know if your take on this is the same, but among young people... Like us. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're in our <laughs> mid-twenties. Um, and <laughs> um, that there is this, you know, perception that uh, government is not, is that if you want to do public service, that you don't go into government anymore, the way a generation earlier one might, uh, that, uh, that public service uh, is, you change making comes in other directions. And, you know, indeed, um, I think, you know, it's hard to think of any uh, current senator or recent secretary of education who's had as much impact on education as Wendy Kopp did in her dorm room at Princeton by starting Teach for America. Um, and Enough of the Ivy League. Is there any public school person that you've ever met that's just nailing it? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I, and you're speaking at UCSB tomorrow, I, FYI. Uh, I would probably cite UCSB as yeah. uh, gold standard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you know, I think more broadly, the, partly because we wrote a book in part about philanthropy, that some people think that that means we think that these issues are best addressed through philanthropy. And, you know, that is fundamentally, basically is not true. I mean, if you look at domestic poverty, then early childhood education, I think, is a critical step to provide broader opportunity in this country. And one would never think about building an interstate highway system with bank sales or by asking people to go out with a shovel, shovel and build one more square foot of highway. I mean, that would be absurd. And yet, fundamentally, we're trying to build a safety net for kids especially and in some ways early childhood education with something that smacks a little bit of bank sales and, and volunteerism. Um, and so we really encourage advocacy to try to push the levers. I mean, it's, it's always people like kids who don't vote who get the fewest resources. And we have voices. We can, through various organizations, lend those voices to others. But I also, I mean, conversely, there are some people who think that philanthropy is irrelevant. And it seems to me that while government has a huge role to play and is dropping the ball, that in the interim, we should also do what we can through philanthropy to try to make a difference, to make sure that just because we can't help everybody doesn't mean we should help nobody. Right. And uh, philanthropy has had a huge impact on uh, the finances of business schools around the country, for example. I mean, imagine the effect that it could have on nursery schools um, if there were a different way of thinking. And so I... I'd love to see government do a better job using evidence-based approaches of trying to create broader opportunity around the country. And I, I do think, I mean, I, one of my basic feelings is that liberals like myself tend to overdo the word inequality, which tends to be a liberal word. And opportunity is probably a better word. That uh, opportunity, you know, the word that I think opportunity is the word that pulls the best of any word. I saw one study that 97% uh, of Americans agreed that there should be broader opportunity for kids at the beginning of life. 97%? You know, 97% of Americans don't agree that the world is round. Um, you know, not, and, uh, yeah, and so I wonder if there are some opportunities, you know, to do a little more kind of bridge building, but 
in the interim, we've got to push every button we can. That includes philanthropy. I think I, you know, I mentioned I might ask this, but I thought to that vein, I think one of the, you know, we've been providing a lot of support in Ebola because of the, we, we've been working in both Liberia and Sierra Leone with just amazingly dedicated people, very highly skilled, uh, one of whom is a, you know, actually the two were Harvard uh, nationals of the country, postdoc or medical school at Harvard, went back and started kind of versions of partners in health and both had worked with Paul Farmer um, and they became central to the effort in um, once the Ebola broke out. But it's, uh, you know, it's striking how this, the relative slowness of the government to act, Director Leaf has cleaned out at, at 150 tons now, that actually was done efficiently, fulfilled on an order. But one of the interesting things about the philanthropy piece um, is the vast majority of the money that's been donated philanthropically has come from a small group of people, mainly the, the tech uh, folks, the, uh, the Gates and the Paul Allen Foundation, which uh, gave directly a million dollars, which is amazing, but a lot of their money um, has gone to the government for the CDC, which is an interesting, so the largest philanthropic investment for Ebola has been from private to the, including the U.S. government because of the stalemate in Congress. But it, as I mentioned, to me it was a fascinating through the looking glass moment where the government was actually able to scale up in part because of Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, and others. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, it seems to me that we're in this evolving moment of yeah. trying to figure these roles out. I mean, a, a couple of thoughts there. One is that it's just fascinating how some issues get the public's attention and, and get people to respond. So a natural disaster is just ideal. I mean, you know, uh, a Haiti earthquake, a tsunami in Asia, people will be so generous. Um, in contra and that's partly because of the way we in the news media cover it. I mean, you know, if it's something dramatic like that, we're all over it. And it goes into your living room through the TV, it tugs your heartstrings, people respond. What we are worst at covering, and therefore what people are worst at responding to, is the things that happen every day. Uh, because there is no day in which there are news, and that tends to be public health disasters. It's, you know, kids dying of diarrhea, it's kids dying of malaria tuberculosis, things that are kind of boring and never make news and therefore never draw sympathy. And one consequence of that in turn is that we are the world's worst investors uh, in addressing things. I mean, if you think of Ebola, if there had been, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollar investment at the beginning of April when this was first identified, you could have stopped Ebola in its tracks uh, at minimal cost in lives and money. Instead, we're going to probably end up spending uh, $10 billion and you know, many, many, many thousands of people have died unnecessarily. Uh, there's still perhaps some risk that this will become uh, endemic in West Africa. And um, that was unnecessary. But so often, we end up you know, we don't, we don't make investments. We don't pick the low-hanging fruit. We end up picking this incredibly high-hanging fruit uh, all over. And I, I, mean, I think it's kind of the same with, with early childhood interventions, that we don't um, intervene. There are various interventions to improve pregnancy outcomes. Uh, tw in West Virginia, 20% of kids born these days are born with drugs in their system. 20%. Now, there are various interventions that... Um, will um, um, we'll reduce that, not to zero, but we'll reduce it. These are very cheap, but we can't muster the, the gumption to do that. We can't muster the gumption to, um, uh, I was talking with somebody about Title 10 funding for family planning. It's gone down by two thirds since 1980. Um, and uh, every dollar invested in family planning for at risk uh, kids is going to reduce public spending later on by five or six dollars. But we can't, you know, we don't invest in some of these really high return investments, whether domestically or abroad, because they're, they're not sexy, they don't get public attention. Um, and so we spend ten billion dollars on Ebola, or we invest in prisons, whatever it may be. And one of the things that, in fact, to show you this, we just had these made. These are, uh, we work a lot with the companies, and one of the things we've never been able to get donated is prenatal vitamins, which are, you know, usually you'd want 
nutrition to come from food, and you don't want to assume a vitamin is going to make you taller and prettier and smarter. The prenatal vitamins, the World Health Organization, UNICEF said, that actually, in this case, for pregnant lactating women, it's really important. We've just never been able to get them donated. So uh, we were asked in the after the Philippines, it said the medicines were great. Um, There's a lot of infection in it kind of a year ago with uh, Typhoon Yolanda Haiyan. So we just thought, how would Costco do this? They were pretty smart. So we just found a contract manufacturer three dollars and 88 cents delivered the direct relief prenatal vitamins 250 tablets one tablet a day uh, almost the entire course of pregnancy and you know i just thinking about it it's like this is something that's going to be fun to do we have a great women's group but that's a very nick christoph sort of thing i figure so i, I meant to pitch you that but here we are um and the other thing i think as i was talking there were two things as the early childhood development as a parent of three how does all this play out at home? I mean, inspiring your kids with burdened by what you've seen, which, you know, both privilege and burdened by things that many of us are thankful we haven't seen, but still inspired. How does that translate in the house? I mean, probably like a lot of you, you know, Cheryl and I, we, we want to get our kids to be empathetic and engaged citizens. Um, and we learned pretty quickly that um, telling them to do so didn't work very well. You know? uh, that, uh, you know, modeling behavior seems to be the best solution, um, or maybe telling them not to do something. Don't be empathetic. And, you know, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so what we really did was we tried to expose them to get them out of their cocoon. You know, their kind of upper middle class cocoons and neighborhoods. One of the things that is fascinating in America is that. Um, the wealthiest 20% of Americans donate less to charity than the poorest 20%, even though the bottom 20% mostly can't um, uh, itemize deductions, don't get the tax benefit. And why is that? It turns out to be essentially because of where you live and who you interact with. That if you are affluent, you live in a nice neighborhood. You interact with other people who are reasonably well off. You don't really encounter need. Well, if you are poor in America today, then every day you encounter people who are needier than yourself. And it seems to be a function thus of essentially, you know, your perspective and the needs you encounter. And so we wanted to encourage our kids to understand that they had won the lottery of birth uh, and that there were obligations to go with that. So we tend to drag them around on trips. I, I remember um, my daughter, uh, when she was, I think, a freshman in high school, I was... Um, taking her through these um, gang checkpoints in uh, Tegucigalpa and Honduras and saying brightly, oh, you know, pretty soon we'll be out of here and we'll be in rural Nicaragua. And <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she said, oh, you know, Dad, you know, my friends, you know, when they go on vacations, <laughs> you know, they go to the Caribbean. And uh, so Cheryl and I talked about it and we decided as a family, our next family vacation was indeed going to be uh, to the Caribbean. So the next Thanksgiving, we all went together um, to Haiti during the cholera outbreak. <laughs> <laughs> so we dragged them through cholera clinics. Uh, and, you know, it, I think that at some level it has made them, you know, understand just how, how sort of how lucky we are that this notion of, I think one of the most dangerous things if you're successful is to think, you know, you look in the mirror and say, boy, I'm good, you know, I worked hard, I got a good education, you know, I've earned everything I've got. And if somebody is less successful, you know, that that's, it's not just an economic failure, it's a moral failure. And I think that one of the things I've certainly seen from my travels is that very often, if you're successful, so much of that has to do with your parents who were nurturing, who loved you, who spoke to you a lot, who supported you. Um, you know, it, that the hard work came too, but so much of it was, um, was this lottery of birth. And I think that's, that's one of the crucial things one can, one hopes, try to convey to one kids when they're in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um... It strikes me, as you were talking, I think the, um, the risk that, I mean, does the risk, if we figure out that the technique to compel people is really this hardwired 
pathway is the risk that is, is often accused of like marketing takes over. So that if we all know that that's true, we will all do that. And irrespective of whether what the so that's the messaging that's going to compel the gift and actually de incentivize actually doing the work that you're supposed to be getting money for. And we struggle with that here. What is the appropriate calibration not to, to be respectful of the people, um, but not patronize them, and be respectful of the people who support your seeking, not play to their emotions just because it's work. And I think that's something that nonprofits have criticized of ah, that's going to work. Everyone pull that emotional cord. And then people, you know, I think in the long run, it's like they check out, they feel like they've been played. Is there some risk in that? I mean, I think you see the, the uh, controversy of the Red Cross in Sandy for what looked like that exactly. I mean, there's fantastic people work there. It's a fantastic institution. I'm not meaning to criticize, but the reporting was that the priority was on the projection of a message, not the doing of the work. And I think so part of it is like, let's be careful what we learn too much of, right? I know I would push back. Is that a, a really bit, yeah. confusing question. It was really clear when I was speaking it, but uh, sorry. I would. I mean, I would really like to see nonprofits become, if you will, more manipulative, uh, better marketers. Uh, and I say that. Look out, Santa Barbara. <laughs> you know, it does seem to me that it frustrates me as a journalist that when corporations reach out to me, my assistant for a while was writing a cosmetics column for the Times. And so she was getting pitched all the time by mascara companies or lipstick companies with the most professional pitches by, you know, mercenary marketers who were incredibly good at what they were doing. And meanwhile, I would be getting pitches from, you know, <laughs> no, 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 organizations doing truly life-saving work, girls' education, bed nets, whatever it may be, with kind of pathetic pitches from people who didn't really know marketing, from, you know, because it, because if you're in the non, if you're doing God's work, then you tend to think marketing, you flinch at the idea of marketing, marketing is beneath me, you know, I'm, I'm out saving lives, and it seems to me that it's so much more important to market if you're doing something potentially life-saving than if you're selling mascara, and where, I mean, universities are examples of a, a class that has been figured out over the last generation how to uh, sell development incredibly well. I mean, they sell the same building about 10 times over. You know, you have the same, you know, the Smith wing of the Jones building and the such and such classroom. And, and the, I mean, naming opportunities work. Uh, recognition works. This, and if one could bring some of that savvy more of that savvy, I think, uh, to um, you know, to organizations that are truly doing the most important work in the world. That I think would be we'd all be better off. Um, and I think the real, you know, I think the real lessons about there, there's some folks who have. Um, we write about Charity Water uh, in in the book, which is incredibly good at marketing and. Their wells are actually often dug by the International Rescue Committee, which is kind of the gold. I mean, it's just a brilliant organization. But these days, I'd say that probably among young people, Charity Water is better known than the IRC. Uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. And they, I think that as a result, it, it does seem to me that there's something that the, the, the secular secular world can learn some mega churches. That the secular world tends to make giving this private activity often with a feeling that there's some sacrifice attached to it. Mega churches have grown in part because they've made um, pro-social activities this social, joyous, collective uh, activity that is meant to be fun. There's no, there's no sense of sacrifice. And I think that as America becomes less religious, it's important to have, to figure out ways for the secular world to fill that pro-social, joyous, give back space. One of the interesting things among